Well, welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to break a promise. Today we were going to build the Mark XA, whatever this is. I can't remember whether it's Mark IV, but anyway, it's the latest version of the head which takes away all the manufacturing problems for those guys that don't have a workshop or taps or things like that. It's all designed and I was planning to cut it today but something else has jumped into the queue something that can have an effect on what we're going to do with this head so I thought I would take this rather more important subject first and after the last session on lenses I started thinking a little bit more seriously about these things nozzles now we've trusted that the Chinese or whoever designed these machines have done their homework and got the design of these things correct. Should I be that trusting? I think not. So what today we're going to do is we're going to profile the beam that's in this machine which is a 60 watt, 65 watt type machine and we're also going to profile the lenses, the beam as it comes out of the lenses. Because the shape of the beam does it actually pass through that hole or is it hitting the inside? So as usual come on in and let's have a bit of a closer look at what I'm going to be doing. Now as usual you can see that I've got some fairly sophisticated test equipment here. I've got a um, I think it's a mayonnaise jar with some water in the bottom. Now as I said the fortunate thing about this head design is it makes life very easy for doing some of this test work. Now I'm going to put one of my little cardboard discs in here. I've got the machine power set to maximum power, 65% in this particular instance, which gives me around about probably 65, 60, 65 watts. And what I'm going to do is just turn my air assist on, because I can do that manually on this machine. And I've got just a small amount of airflow coming out here, so that I can blow the air through the back here right? because I'm obviously going to cause a little fire there and I don't want all the smoke to go up here and get on my mirror so I'm just going to do a series of pulses because <clears throat> if we do it, if we do one solid pulse we shall get a big flame but if I do it as a series of pulses you'll see what happens Now I'm now going to start holding the beam on for longer and you can see the way in which the first of all we're getting some steam from the water that's underneath you can hear it crackling as it boils is that hole getting any bigger? I don't think so so I know the beam diameter that could come out of the tube will be limited by the size of the window on the end of the tube. I mean the beam cannot get bigger than that window and that window is about 12.7 millimetres diameter. And I think you can see there that we've just about got a full beam. 12.7. <laughs> so the fact that the tube specification says this is a 6 millimetre diameter beam a um, little bit of a joke in a way but of course you don't normally have the beam on the whole time so consequently what you would normally do is have this beep and there we go look there's our six millimeter beam <laughs> well I'll leave you to judge for yourself what size beam we should be working with now the answer to that question really is quite simple. If I'm running a long cut, then even though the energy is not staying in one place on the cut, the energy is full bore on the top of the lens. So technically we've got a 12.7 diameter beam on top of the lens before it starts to focus down. 
So that's, our, that's one of our starting points. Now, if you've got a 40 watt tube, you may well find that that same test will give you possibly, even though it's claimed to be possibly a three millimeter diameter beam, you probably find that you've got an eight millimeter total diameter. Might be bigger, you'll have to find out for yourself doing the same sort of test. So now I'm in the fortunate position with this machine. I can drop this little nest in here and we can drop a one and a half inch lens in there. Well, as you can see, I've got a very sophisticated setup here. Um, let's not go into too much detail other than the fact that I've got a water trough at the bottom here to catch the power as it comes through the lens and it'll just absorb the energy. Um, I've got my air assist pointing down at the water because it will very likely boil on the surface and produce steam and I don't want that steam to come up and start curling the paper because I want the focal distance to remain fairly constant on this solid metal surface here. Now I'm limited to the gauges that I have for doing this work but I don't think that's a problem because what I've got here is an even more sophisticated packing piece. It's a piece of 19 millimeter thick aluminium section. So here's the plan. We've got our piece of paper which is 0.3 millimeters thick but really doesn't come into the equation that is suspended over our water trough. So we've got a 19 millimeter spacer block here upon which I'm going to sit my little measuring ramp. This lens is sitting four millimeters above the bottom surface of the head. And at the moment, I've got a 38.1 millimeter lens in there, an inch and a half lens. And what I've got to do is work out what dimension X is, very simply. So the 38.1 is between the surface of the paper and the bottom surface of the lens. So to get dimension X, which is the dimension I'm going to have to use my spacer at, all I need to do is to take 19.4 plus 4 millimetres away from 38.1 and that gives me 15.1 millimetres. Now look, we're not going to worry about this 0.1 because all we're really interested in is to find out approximately whether the Chinese designers have made their nozzles to suit the lenses. So here's the bottom surface of the head which is nice and easy to measure from and as I said the lens is sitting four millimetres above here. It's sitting actually on this top surface here. So there's my first test coming up, 15 millimetres. Now to make sure that everything stays nice and flat what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little weight on there to keep that nice and flat just so that when heat gets into that material it doesn't really try and buckle. So here's a quick pulse and look at that lovely lovely small hole. That's exactly what you'd expect from a 38.1 lens. Okay, let's now start holding the pulse on a little bit longer as if we were doing a cut, for example. It would be on continuously. Now I'm gradually taking the power on so that I don't catch fire. I just want the little speckles around the outside. And there we go. So that's 38 mil. The next one 37 mil. As I shorten the focal length, you'll see that the little red speckles around the outside of the hole, I have to be very careful because if I keep the beam on too long, the paper will catch fire. So I have to just give it a pulse and get the pulses long enough to just see the red dots appear. And then I've got to stop. Because I certainly don't want to catch fire to the paper, I just want to find the extremity of the burning. So I have to let it cool down and then start again. And now I'm holding the beam on continuously and I'm not getting virtually any response. That's the point where I stop. Right, well let's take a look at our results. 
everything was going well until I got down to 32. And then I was a bit ambitious and I left it on too long and it caught fire and it burnt a big hole in there. So I had to be a little bit more careful from 32 downwards. Uh, but you can see there's a definite pattern that we're getting here of getting bigger and bigger and bigger. OK, so let's take a look at these under the microscope and see what we saw. Now, this was the very first one at the focal point, 38. And as you can see, we've got a hole in there, which is where the high density part of the beam is on continuously. And it's, what, around about point... It's nearly a millimetre diameter, because it's about half a mil, maybe 0.8. But look at this round here. This is the low energy density that's scorching the material rather than burning it. You know, the, you can see the energy profile of the beam here, starting off from very low, going to very high in the centre. Now, even, in, even right in the centre here, there's not enough energy to evaporate the carbon and get rid of it. Um, and so consequently, we've still got a very thick carbon ring around here before we get to this browning. And look, we've got probably from there to probably about here. What's that? 1, 2.4, 2.2, 2.4 millimetres diameter. So that's just a starting point at the focal point. <laughs> You're going to say, yeah, but, but this is not real. Agreed, this particular piece here is not real because you don't hold the beam on in one place and produce this effect. That's not the point of this exercise. If you're doing a cut, you are holding the beam on through the nozzle. It might not be happening like this where you're cutting or where you're engraving, but the beam is on. I mean, if we start moving back from 38 millimetres, which is the focal point, by just two millimetres, and by the time we get to 10 millimetres above the focal point, look, we're out here at about 4.5 millimetres diameter with a very, very big hole in the middle that is over one, 1.5 it's, it's nearly three millimetres diameter, that high energy part of the beam. Now, it's not surprising because bear in mind, we started off at 12.7. This is the special one and a half inch nozzle that you can buy. Okay, and that's what I've drawn here. It's got a 2.5 hole in the bottom, exactly the same as the long nozzle, 2.5 millimetre hole in the end. This is a one and a half inch lens that's set 38, mil 38 millimetres back from the focus point. And here we've got a 12.7 pink beam coming in and then being focused down to a focus point. I've, I've drawn it as a straight line, um, but that is supposedly including all the low energy density as well, right out to the extreme. OK, now this blue highlighted section here is the shape of the inside of this nozzle. The pink section here, the pink beam, is the theoretical maximum size beam that should include the low energy density stuff that's right at the outside of the beam focusing down to a focus point. Well, here we've got two different pictures. We've got the high energy density blue lines up here which represent the size of the holes in that pattern. That's where the damage to this material is being done. And the red line here is the brown scorch halo around the outside. And as you can see, there is a lot of the low energy density part of the beam that does not make it through the orifice. It's being absorbed by the nozzle and probably the air assist, because this is an aluminium material, the air assist is busy cooling the nozzle down because this must be heating the inside of the nozzle up because it's anodized inside 
and will absorb the energy. So this is energy that isn't going into our cut. Yeah, this, this pinky red highlight that I've put on here is in fact the size of this nozzle. This is a one and a half inch nozzle that's supplied with the China Blue Machine and it's got a four millimeter hole in the end. Ha ha ha, four millimeter hole. Yeah, that's no good for cutting, is it? Well, it probably isn't much good for cutting because there's such a low flow rate through it. On the other hand, it does allow everything that a one and a half inch lens wants to throw at it. So at the moment, it would certainly appear that the people that designed this one and a half inch nozzle don't really understand what's happening with the beam. Whereas the people that designed this one seem to. Now, as soon as we change to a two inch focal length lens, I'm suspecting that this might get better. And we may well find that we can get our two inch beam through this small hole. Now, it could possibly be that a meniscus lens, a one and a half inch meniscus lens, may improve this situation because there's not as much spherical aberration on it and we won't get as much halo. We'll probably get more of the energy coming down this pink towards this pink line. But I'm not going to worry about that because, hey, these nozzles are designed to suit any lens, even the worst possible lens which is the ones that I'm testing at the moment, which is the one and a half inch Plano Convex, which we know has got some fuzziness about the focus point. Now, also the other thing that will happen is, if I reduce the power of this machine to a lesser power, I shall finish up with a smaller beam as well. So, you know, this is only a 60 watt machine, but I think 60 watts and above will all have a maximum beam diameter of about 12.7 because the window on the end of the, the tube does not get any bigger, as far as I'm aware, with bigger tubes. They all remain at around about 12.7. If you've got a 40 watt machine, you may not even be worrying about this because your beam will already be smaller to start with, which means it starts off smaller here, which means it will be slightly smaller as it passes through this orifice here. Okay, so let's now go and check what happens with a two inch lens. Again, this is a Plano convex lens, two inches. Before we dive in, and look at the results that I've collected for the two inch and two and a half inch. Let's just go back a little bit to where I started at the beginning of this session. There are very few companies out there, SPT is an exception, and also this machine, the, the tube I've got in this machine is also an exception, um, that will provide you with information about the so-called spot size of the tube. Now that's not the same as the spot size of the lens, this is the so-called working diameter of the beam that comes out of the tube. If we take a look at what SPT claim for a 75 watt tube, or it's actually claimed as a 70 watt tube, which is exactly the same as this tube in here, they're claiming that it's four millimeters plus or minus a millimeter. And then for a 100 watt tube, it's five millimeters and a 150 watt tube is six millimeters. Do I believe that? Is that the basis upon which these nozzles were originally designed? The information that comes from the tube manufacturers? Just bear that in mind. This is my tube in this machine, the one that we've been working with. These do actually declare a spot size for the beam coming out of the tube. What is it? <laughs> Four millimeters. Wow. What's this? Hmm, other than lost for words, what can I say? Um, that didn't make a lot of sense, did it? Well, here are our results from the two and a half inch lens. And as we can see, I've superimposed those results in here. Here's our 12.7 diameter beam running into the lens, which is a two and a half inch 
holder with a two and a half inch lens in it. Because the lens is so far away, we've got a fairly shallow included angle here for the beam. And that, by the time it gets to the tip here, you would think that that would pass cleanly through the orifice at the end. Well, certainly my pink beam passes through there cleanly, but that's not reality. That's just a guess, the best sensible guess for the path of the light. In reality, we know that blue here represents the holes that we're burning in this paper. So it represents the high energy part of the beam. And the red represents the scorch mark around the outside, which is the lower energy part of the beam. Well, this is a 2.5 nozzle. And at this point here, we need 3.7 to go through unhindered. So note that number, 3.7. And here we are with a two inch lens, where of course, this angle here is a wider angle. So you'd expect possibly, if there's going to be a clash, there's probably going to be a bit more of a clash with this. And sure enough, it's gone from 3.7 to 3.8. Let's have a quick look down here and see what's going on. Well, it's virtually exactly the same thing. Look, the high energy is just about squeezing through that two and a half millimeter hole, but the halo or corona is not. So again, we're absorbing energy into the nozzle with this two inch lens. Let's take a look at the one and a half inch lens. Now this is a standard long nozzle in which I've put a small recess at the back to take an 18 millimeter diameter lens. And here it is. And as you can see, this allows me to cut with about a 4.1 spacing off the, uh, away from the work. And when we take a look down inside here, again, it's very, very similar to what we've seen on all the other lenses, even though this angle has now widened even more. But this time it looks as though we've actually cleared the bore with the high energy density. And it's only the low energy, which appears to be much wider than these other bands, which is hitting the side. But 4.2 clears that. So for our cutting nozzles, from what we've seen so far, we need a 3.7, a 3.8 hole in the end, and a 4.2. Well, certainly we're not going to uh, change the nozzles for all of those dimensions. We've got to find some sort of compromise. Now, whether it's 4 mil or whether it is actually 4.5, I'm yet to decide. Well, more than a year ago, I took this standard long nozzle, which is exactly the same as this nozzle here, and I modified it to take a one and a half inch lens. And how I modified it was to drop the lens into there about six millimeters deep. Now by dropping it in there, six millimeters deep, as I've shown here, what I've actually done, I've actually pushed the cone further forward. And in pushing that cone further forward, what I've done to clear now our corona or halo, I need to put a 5.4 hole in there. Well, that's silly because I'm not going to put a, a 5.4 hole in there because I think it will completely destroy the airflow. <clears throat> the reason being, we've only got a four millimeter hole in here to get the air in. And to have a 5.4 hole out, means that the velocity of air is going to be very, very slow. 22.9 square millimetres. And what have we got at the moment? Well, we've got 2.5 at the moment, equals 3.5, sorry, 2.5 diameter. So we may well have doubled the diameter, but we've quadrupled the area. And then the other thing to look at is the bore that's coming in, which is four millimeters diameter, 12.6 millimeters squared. So we've got air coming in on that area, but going out on that area. 
So we've got at least a 50% velocity reduction because the area is twice as big. So we're not going to get a very good flow out of this nozzle at 5.4 millimetres. And, well, I just didn't understand. Ignorance is bliss. And of course, what I'm showing you here today has been in existence for many years. Has anybody else bothered to look at this? Now, one other alternative for this one and a half inch lens. So we've got this standard nozzle here, which has been specifically designed to work with a one and a half inch lens on this standard lens tube system. Does it work? Well, I think the answer is here. No, it doesn't work because we need a 4.4 hole through here to clear this low density area part of the beam. We've now got to go and find out whether or not this hole diameter is that critical. I've got to do some power measurements before and after the nozzle and then I've got to modify the nozzles and work out whether or not we get better cutting performance from the nozzle if we're collecting all of the power. So <clears throat> a 4.2 would cover cutting for this 4 inch, cutting for this 2.5 inch, cutting for this 2 inch and if we go about it this way here, this is a one and a half inch cutting. Then we've covered all four lenses with this standard long nozzle. Now the only thing we've got to do is to decide what size hole we need in the end. Because it certainly isn't 2.5 and I say I have to laugh out loud when I know that one of the lenses in the Thunder Laser range is two millimetres diameter. Now you could take another view on this and say whoever designed these nozzles has actually been very clever. Because yes, they intended to only let the high energy part of the beam through and in fact they're using this as an occlusion to stop the low energy part of the beam getting out there and causing our corona or our burning. Well, I'm not sure that is truly the case because this is something that I see regularly when I'm trying to burn small dots and it's that black mark round the dot that you can see with your eye when you look at the picture. Whereas in fact all you really want to see when you look at the picture is the holes or the, the really high density black dots. Maybe I'm to being too generous by trying to find excuses for the designers of this nozzle or these nozzles. Perhaps they believed this, that we were going to get a five millimeter diameter beam. Well, here I've got in black a five millimeter diameter beam. And as you can see, it is substantially narrower and it looks as though it probably would pass through there cleanly. Let's have a quick zoom in and see. And here it is, here and here. And as we look at it passing through here and here, it is very, very narrow and it should do a great job. Possibly, just possibly, there is enough space in here off the beam to allow both of these to get inside that two and a half millimeter nozzle. I haven't tested it because I don't have a four millimeter We've beam. We've got this long nozzle here now. So we could use this, let's call it a universal nozzle because now with a small groove in the back, and I'm trying to persuade one of the manufacturers to put this groove in for me, we should be able to cut with a four inch lens, a two and a half inch lens, a two inch lens, and a one and a half inch lens. But the one and a half inch lens can't be 20 mil, which is the standard for this system. It's got to be an 18 mil that goes in there. But that's a very small compromise to have one nozzle that works across the whole range. The only problem we've got now is to work out what size we're going to make that hole in there. Now, <laughs> that's a big decision because we've got to work out just how much power we're losing because we've got a small hole in there. So I've got to go back and I've got to do some experiments with power loss across the nozzle now, not across the lens, but across the nozzle itself. And then we've got to see if that is significant, 
what size hole I can put in to rectify the problem. And then of course all the work that I did in the last session comparing lenses, I used this one and a half inch system. Now I haven't done anything wrong, I've just used all standard equipment. I just didn't realise that the standard equipment wasn't up to the job, maybe. Now when it comes to engraving, you need a completely different sort of nozzle. We're looking with engraving to have a long distance between the work and the nozzle. If you don't have a long distance between the work and the nozzle, then what will happen is you will get a build up of debris on the front face here and block your nozzle up. You won't actually block it up because what will happen is the laser beam will keep burning it free. But you'll get a build up of crud on the front here and because it's quite close to the work it will sometimes drop off right in the middle of your work. So this is not a very good system to use for engraving. If you're stuck with an engraving cum cutting job then I'm afraid you have no choice because this is the only lens that will cut and engrave. If you try and cut with this one it will produce a pretty nasty brown mess around your cut although it will, grave, although it will engrave great. And again that nozzle will have a groove in the back so that you can use the 18 millimeter one and a half lens that you've got in here into this job as well. So all you'll do is replace this nozzle with this nozzle and you've got two one and a halves, one cutting, one engraving and then you've got your full range here and here of cutting and engraving. Two nozzles, four lenses and you can conquer the world. Now that's for this standard assembly. There is another assembly around which we're going to have to talk about in another session and that's this one. That's the one that came off this machine originally and it is a one and a half inch lens holder and it will do most of these functions. It already has a four millimeter hole in it. Hey somebody thought about it. I've laughed about this four millimeter hole and said why have they made it so big? Now I've answered my own question. So this is much more of a universal nozzle than these have ever been. So if your nozzle has got a four millimeter hole in it, congratulations. If it hasn't, then we've got to work out what we need to do to modify them. It's not going to be difficult to modify them because they've got a nice tapered hole down the inside and if you've got a drill, you can physically just open these holes out. Well, I can only apologize again for not getting onto the head transplant problem. But I think you can see this is a bigger issue than that at the moment, especially as it could affect the lens work that I did last time. So I've got to go back and rework that and find out whether that is still valid or whether some of the results here have been influenced by these nozzles. Well, thank you very much for your time and I'll catch up with you again in the next session.